Hello, everyone. Welcome to Talking Logistics, where we have conversations with thought leaders and newsmakers in the supply chain logistics industry. It's my great pleasure to welcome today's program, Mike Riccio, who's Chief Marketing Officer at Leonard's Express, and Prasad Galopoli, who is founder and CEO of Trucker Tools. And today we're going to talk about how digital platforms are driving a new era in transportation. Now, the pace of change and innovation in technology continues to, to accelerate, and it's, uh, you know, technology is playing a greater role uh, you know, across all industries. So, you know, how is technology transforming the transportation and logistics industry? How is real-time freight visibility uh, delivering business value and, you know, helping to lead some of this transformational change? And, you know, how do you drive adoption in business value ultimately in, in this market? Well, those are some of the key questions that we're going to address in today's episode. And it's great to have Mike and Prasad in the program to share their insights and advice on this topic. So, uh, Mike, Prasad, welcome to the program. Oh, thank you, Adrian. Glad to be here. Same here, Adrian. Um, uh, happy to be here. Great. Well, Mike, uh, you, you know we've had Prasad on, uh, you know, uh, several times, but you're a first-time guest here on, on Talking Logistics, and um, you know, some people might be familiar with Leonard's Express, some people may not. So, before we dive into the kind of the subject here, uh, why don't we? You want to tell us a little bit about Leonard's Express, you know, the types of services you offer and the industries that you serve, and what your role and responsibilities are there at the company. Sure. Uh, Leonard's Express is a uh, family-owned transportation provider. We're located here in upstate New York, which is uh, actually Farmington, New York, which is just outside of Rochester. We operate a, an asset division and a non-asset division. On our asset division, we're operating around 450 trucks and around 800 trailers, both dry and refrigerated. Uh, on the non-asset side, we have multiple offices around the country. Uh, we're, we're not really a small company, but we're not a large company. We're um, uh, going to do around 230 to 240 million in revenue this year. Uh, it's split evenly between our asset division and the non-asset division. And it's a family-owned business. I'm part of the family that owns the business, and I'm the chief marketing officer for the company. And the sales strategy falls under me, and the marketing and branding is, is also my responsibility. Predominantly, we haul grocery and food-related products. Great. Well, you know, certainly uh, great to have family owned businesses, uh, you know, having come from uh, a family that had its own business. I know the, 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 the value of family owned businesses and the challenges and, and everything else, especially in a very competitive market <laughs> here now in, in you know, transportation and, and everything that's happening, uh, you know, in the industry. So, so let's get right to it, Mike. I mean, uh, being in the front lines and being a family business and it's a sizable, you know, even though it's not, you know, one of the big guys, you know, you right. still have, you know, uh, be, between the asset side and the non-asset side, I mean, you, you got a very a broad range of uh, uh, services there, as well as the type of industries that you offer. I mean, so from from your in from your perspective in the industry, I mean, are we in a new era of transportation, and if, and if so, in in what ways? Yeah, you know, I, you know, I, I know there's a lot of hyperboles being thrown out there right now. You know, technology revolution, or the technology is coming at everybody. You know, like in a fire hose, and everybody's trying to figure out which, which, which system has the right value, which doesn't provide value, what is just a new shiny toy. Um, but really, I do feel we're in it, technology has definitely changed the game. Uh, not only uh, the speed of which things happen, if you stop and think about it, the, you know, the speed at which the market goes from 10 trucks to every load to 10 loads for every truck and back again is, is mind boggling. And really, you need technology to try to keep up with that. And quite frankly, the amount of data that is out there for people to get to that they used to, that they didn't have before. I mean, if you really think about it, it used to be an uninformed market, right? A broker had a relationship with a carrier on one side and with a shipper on the other side. And neither side really knew what the other side had going on. But in today's environment, it's really more of an informed market because um, you can grab data from all different sources and a shipper can kind of figure things out of what's going on in the market rather quickly, and so can a carrier, and, and adjust it accordingly. And um, you know, everybody wants traceability, everybody wants visibility uh, today. It's, it's uh, visibility is it, what used to be uh, uh, an add-on or an extra, really is now quite standard and, and required by most customers. And you need to have that technology to, you know, to really to play in the marketplace. So. For us, it's really just trying to figure out which technology is driving value and which really is just a shiny new toy that really isn't something we could use. Yeah, no, those, those are great points. I think, you know, something you said kind of caught my attention. I mean, I think, 
you, you know, I guess to simplify and oversimplify perhaps, but you know, it used to be, hey, can you get, can you get uh, my, my load from point A to point B or can, can you, you know, find me a load from my truck, right? Um, and that's still obviously, you know, still the, the important piece of it at the core of it, but it's beyond that today because a lot of what both the carriers want and the shippers want is visibility and they, they want data and they have access to data, you know, now. So what they're viewing now from their uh, you know, partners such as yourself is not just to be a provider of capacity at affordable rates and so forth. They're looking to you as being, you know, providers of insights and data and analytics and so forth to help your, your customers drive better, uh, you know, more, more successful operations, right? Oh, no doubt about it. I mean, I think that all in our personal lives today, we're, we're, we're accustomed to pushing a button and having that product there, you know, sometimes in Amazon's case, you know, drone drops it there in an hour, uh, or, or, you know, and, and everybody is, uh, has those expectations in their personal. So uh, they're also expecting it, you know, in the, in the business sense. And that data that's available for everybody to make better decisions and help shippers make better decisions and help carriers be more productive um, didn't used to be there and now it's there. And um, you, you just have to be able to uh, understand that and utilize that appropriately to survive in today's environment. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, everybody talks about the Amazon effect and I think, you know, mm -hmm. we've seen it in kind of the B2C space, but absolutely it's, it's kind of being adopted here in the B2B you know, the business to business realm as well. Well, Prasad, you know, going over to you now, I mean, you know, we've talked a little bit about technology uh, now and, and Mike gave some great, uh, uh, you know, he talked about, you know, how do you separate, you know, the, the shiny new toys from the things that are actually going to deliver value and, and address the needs of the market. I mean, how are, uh, how are digital platforms enabling, you know, this new era in transportation as Mike just described it? So, uh, you know, <clears throat> what Mike said is, is is absolutely right. Everything is built on data today. Everybody, you know, we're, we're not talking about technology separate from data. So the underlying data is, you know, uh, I was at, at one of the conferences and somebody said, are we in a technology revolution or are we in a data revolution? It's the, the boundaries are kind of blurred a little bit because, you know, you take an example of, um, when you look at a 3PL and a shipper and a carrier relationship, um, they want to know when the load is being picked up, whether it's being picked up as, as scheduled, um, whether it's in, in transit, if so, is it going to make the appointment for the delivery on time or not? If there are exceptions, how soon can I know this? This is just one part of the supply chain. We deal with uh, many more um, nuances like this, right? Just that alone relies on the fact that you want to know exactly where it is and what's the predictability that this load gets delivered on time. What are certain factors that could impact like the weather, traffic and others, right? Um, so that data is the key. And, you know, uh, in, in many ways, tech, what technology is doing is um, taking enormous amounts of data that's available out there, crunching it down to really what's important for us and converting that into information. The information such as your load is going to be there on time, or you know, we just realized that your time, your load is not going to be on time, it's going to be delayed by two hours. So you're immediately telling the, the shipper about it, so the shipper could take necessary steps. That's, it's, it all comes down to that. Um, in many ways, it might even trigger an alert to the shipper, so they're already thinking about contingency plans. So that, part of it, that technology is, is not a one and done. So what technology is doing to the, the brokers and carriers in specific is um, allowing them to, to go through these nuances much faster and focus on what's more important than what's not important. Um, so in many ways, we're, these tools are filtering our day, kind of creating efficiencies at a personal level to a organization level and to a supply chain level. You know, I, I like that point about, you know, kind of the lines blurring between, you know, technology and data or, or information. And I think you're right. I mean, I think you said the key word here is, you know, is, is efficiency. And I think because the speed of change is, is, you know, continues to accelerate and the competitive landscape continues to get more, you know, aggressive, um, you know, you just can't throw bodies at the problem anymore, if you will. 
Um, so the you know, kind of key thing is how do you meet these, you know, ever changing, more stringent customer requirements and expectations, but do so in a, in a profitable way so you can scale and grow your operations, right, in, in, in a profitable way. And, and I think that's where this data and this information, to your point, is helping all the parties involved because that's how, at the end of the day what they're trying to do, right? Is they're trying to meet new customer expectations. They're trying to grow and scale, but do so in a, in a, in a profitable uh, way. So, Michael, let's go back to you. And, and can you share a little bit with us about your journey and experience in, in providing, you know, real-time freight visibility? I mean, what, what was the value proposition for, for Lenin's Express? And, you know, how did you roll it out and get drivers to use it and so forth? <laughs> yeah, well, it's been uh, it's been a little bit of an interesting journey, as I'm sure everybody that's gone through this has experienced. Right? Everybody's uh, got their own unique nuances to their network and to their company. But uh, I would think we've all had somewhat similar uh, processes or similar experiences. Uh, for us, we were using a technology partner to handle the visibility and traceability for us. And quite honestly, Adrian, we really were concerned about their long-term viability and kind of their long-term vision as to how this was going to be uh, uh, rolled out and mapped out. And, and so we were out there in the market looking for other vendors to supply that for us. Um, that's when we uh, ran into Prasad and his team. And uh, we, for us, you know, rolling that out was first we had to start really internally. Uh, you know, kind of how, as you indicated right before, it was like, help me get a, you know, help me get this truck matched up with this load, or help me find a load for this, help me find a carrier for this load. I mean, we still have those guys and gals that need to do the, the blocking and tackling to get the freight moved and covered. But what's changed is we need to have a better understanding on the floor level, at that level, of what our customers' expectations are. And that just getting the load covered is no longer just good enough. You've got to get it covered. Then you've got to figure out, keep the customer updated as to where it is at all times, whether it be once an hour, once every two hours, or whatever their intervals are. And so the first step that we did was really educate internally our employees, especially longtime employees, that things were changing, customers' demands were changing, and expectations were changing. And that kind of took a while, right? You got some old school people that have been used to doing things a certain way and well, that's now changed on them. So, you know, part of it was number one, getting people internally uh, prepared and educated as to what was going on. And really for us, the value proposition was to be able to confirm that data and confirm that that, that truck really was where it was supposed to be. You know, before when a customer, you would call a dispatcher and say, you know, I, I, I need a track and trace on truck number one, two, three. It's under a load for shipper X, Y, Z, you know, and that dispatcher would tell you what that was, but maybe that's really where that truck was. Maybe that's really not where that was. I mean, you were basically relying on, um, you, you know, them telling you the truth and your relationship with them. Now, now you can check that out. So now, now you can, you know, right on a map can confirm, yep, that, that truck is really where we think it is and where it's supposed to be. So for us, that was the value proposition, really confirming the accuracy of the, the information of, of where the equipment was. Yeah, no, that, that's great. I think I love the, the part about kind of starting internally with the education process, right? Because, you know, uh, wh whether it's this type of technology or any kind of technology, a lot of times what you hear uh, from, from companies that, that have had successes is that it really begins with that education process and, and buy-in because in the cases where it doesn't work out, um, it, it's where, you know, it's, it's where those change management hurdles, you know, have not, you know, companies have not been able to overcome those, those change management, you know, hurdles. So, so I think that that's a, you know, that, that's pretty, uh, uh, you know, insightful that it kind of gets started that with that internal, you know, piece. Now, now in terms of, you know, from the driver standpoint, I mean, they just start out with, you know, just a handful of drivers and, 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 and carriers to kind of test this out at first, just kind of get that buy-in or did you, how did you roll it out? Well, really we rolled it out. What we did before rolling it out was really work with Prasad and his team is to see how many of our current carriers were already utilizing his, that specific tool. And out of our top 10 carriers, excuse me, top 20 carriers, 92% uh, were already using a tool. So for us, you know, that top 20 handles quite a bit of our freight. So we decided to roll it straight on out and, um, it, it, you know, right, wrong or indifferent. What we did is we just rolled it out. 
uh, put it on the rate confirmations, had confirm had conversations with uh, our carriers, whether it be if it's a, a single truck operator with a you know with a driver himself, or with some of our larger fleets that we work with, the dispatchers and managers of of, of those fleets, and um, really just good old fashioned you know communication, putting it on the rate confirmations, having phone conversations indicating that this is where the market was going and in order to move this low, this is what's required. Um, you know, we had a little concerns about, you know, people uh, having get to get some carriers to download a, uh, another app, but that really didn't turn out to be as a big of a deal as we, we thought it would be. Um, and really some of the, and it, sometimes we've, now that we've had it for a while and, and it's, we're a little bit more mature in the, in the process, we have, it's, it's on our, you know, we're telling our, our drivers and carriers, we're not going to give you the load information, <clears throat> pardon me, until you, you know, <clears throat> download that app and give us your location and accept, uh, accept, uh, you know, the frequency from us so that um, we can track and trace the load. Right, right. Well, it sounds like already, you know, a, a good percentage of the, uh, you know, carriers you were working with already were familiar with with the type of tools, you know, solutions. So uh, obviously that that helped, you know, speed up the uh, the the buy in, if you will, because they were already they're already familiar, right. you know, with it. Uh, so, Prasad, going back to you, I mean, where does, you know, we talked a lot about the technology, about the, the, the data, right? We've been talking a lot about the data and, and, and being able to then, you know, transform that into actionable, you know, information. But where, where does this real-time freight visibility data, you know, come from? I mean, are there multiple ways, to, you know, to capture this data? You know, what are some of the important, you know, considerations or pros and cons around different approaches? Sure. Um, so, when, we, when you look at uh, real-time freight visibility, it typically falls into two categories, right? Two sides rather, not categories. The one side is the actual data of where the truck is or where the cell phone is, which is tied to the, uh, to the truck ride. Um, in at, at, at any given point, that is that location information. Generating that location information, we call this as visibility generation, right? Or, or data generation. The other side is just aggregating that into an easy to use forms and pushing it back into a broker's TMS or a shipper's TMS or whoever needs to get that so that they're not looking at one load at a time, but all of their loads are aggregated. That's that aggregation part. Between these two, um, the generation part is the key. Otherwise, we are building a house without any foundation, literally. I mean, you can aggregate data as much as you want, but if that underlying data is not there, then, I mean, it's got no value. So and when you go into the generation of the data, there are only a few ways we can get that. One is, let's say, you know, through an app or, you know, from the cell phone directly. Back, you know, a couple of years back, a lot of people were able to do the cell phone translation so that, you know, they could get that location, but that's not there anymore. So it all comes down to getting that GPS location from the phone. And there are two ways that that happens. One is, um, you have an app that only does tracking. Flat out, you're telling the driver, all I'm going to do is track you. Um, where we have seen a lot of resistance with, with that approach. The other one is, is what Trucker Tools has taken is put an app that has a lot of value to the driver. And part of that is visibility. So they understand why visibility is there, but it's not fully you know, blocking them. Um, that's the second uh, second approach. A third approach is ELDs. A lot of people might say, hey, well, there is an ELD device in the truck. Why can't we pull that information? There are some hurdles in that. I, you know, we could go into details of what, how the ELD thing is. Uh, and then the, the fourth approach is plain old um, check calls. I mean, calling the driver and saying where you are, right? Like Mike said earlier, we'll have to depend on the driver telling us everything right. And you know, it doesn't matter, right? When the truck is moving along the road and it's expected to deliver on time, you don't expect the driver to tell you a lie. It's usually when there is a delay is when there is a possibility that you may not get the right information. Actually, that is when you want to know the right information more than the other side. So plain old check calls have been the problem. So we we'll, we'll have to take that off the table. But it, you know, it comes down to, Using the driver's cell phone, um, you know, through an app that's not resisted by the drivers or ELDs. And when you look at the ELDs themselves alone, what we have found out is 
on the surface, this whole thought of um, getting the drivers to share their ELD location was good because everybody has a ELD device in the truck. However, a, a lot of uncertainty goes with it. The, the more we dig in, the more we found out that, especially the small carriers or mid-sized carriers, owner operators, they work with multiple brokers. So they always worry about, you know, if I share my data with you, what other things are you seeing first? To who are the people you're sharing this with? Are you sharing this with an insurance company? Uh, and frankly, they have to jump through a bunch of hoops, like to give permission to share their reality data with all the confidentiality around it, right? And when they go through a bunch of hoops to give you permission, the back of their mind, what they're thinking is, if I don't like to work with you and I need to pull the plug, I would have to jump through a bunch of hoops. And most likely I may not be able to fully pull it out. You still know where I am. That uncertainty, that lack of transparency there or that gray area causes a lot of hard work for them. They typically take anywhere up to, you know, from three months to up to six months to give permission. But if they're working closely with a broker, they probably share more. Um, so these are, you know, the, the pros and cons of various things that we have seen. And it, it frankly comes down to when people like Mike have a carrier that they just onboarded and they want to put a load on that, you can't just wait at that point. Onboarding is an important thing. Every day as these carriers come and go in the system, brokers are onboarding new carriers and they like to bring that carrier on board on a system that's consistent. Yeah, yeah, no, that's a great that's a great overview. And I think you know, going back to the you know the, the the check calls. I mean, in addition to you know perhaps some question marks around the uh, the validity of some of the the information being transmitted back. It's just the the, the labor and the time to kind of you know pick up the phone and and right. call in and call out and the number of people. And like we talked about before, you know, if your goal is to drive better efficiency to be able to scale and grow profitably you know, doing check-in calls are, are not part of that equation anymore, right? I mean, that's, that's where, you know, leveraging some of the other technology approaches, whether it's, you know, through ELDs or, the, you know, phone apps and so forth is probably the, uh, you know, it's, it's the direction I think the industry is moving in. Um, so, so, Mike, going back to you, I mean, as you were evaluating, you know, the different solutions and, uh, and, and approaches you wanted to take, I, and you, you kind of touched upon this a little bit, but maybe just to kind of uh, underscore some points. I mean, what, what were some of the key capabilities you were looking for and, you know, what, what factors or attributes ultimately led you to select, you know, Trucker Tools as your, your technology, you know, partner and, and what, what are some of the benefits to date? Yeah, you know, really, uh, we are big on culture. We are, we are big on, and I know it sounds corny, uh, certainly price matters. I'm not to say it does not, would be disingenuous, but, but we're, for us, it's really about uh, sitting down with someone, someone taking the time to really understand how our network works, because as everybody, everybody's network is unique to themselves. And Prasad and his team took the time to do that. And, you know, we had some apprehensions, like I said, you know, on one hand, we were really not real comfortable with our current provider and, and the long-term viability of uh, some of their services. But on the other hand, we had some concerns about downloading the app and, you know, that's one more app and how are you going to get these drivers to, to do that and accept that kind of some of the things that Prasad touched upon uh, about the level of trust, especially when you're dealing with maybe a spot load basis you know, or you're dealing with a brand new carrier that uh, you don't have a relationship yet and you just haven't had the time to develop the relationship and build that trust. But really for us, um, the, 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 the value really was that smart capacity tool. Um, you know, the first was them taking the time to understand our business and work with us. And, uh, the, and we had some concerns because they're at that time, they're, <clears throat> excuse me, their product did not integrate with our, TM, our TMS system. And Prasad worked with us to try to, to do a workaround around the TMS system while they were, we were working on the inter integration. And their customer service was fantastic. Um, every time we asked for something or asked a question, uh, they were not only quick to respond, but worked with us while we were trying to get through the integration with our current TMS system. Because uh, we found that our TMS system at that point in time wasn't the most flexible. Uh, and, and Prasad and his team had to do a few things to, to really get us up and running efficiently. Um, but the smart capacity tool, as soon as we plug that in, um, carriers were calling us on loads that we didn't even have posted. 
right? Carriers that were in our system are now, in, now seeing available loads and, and it really improved uh, productivity. Um, and it also it validated internally with our operations people. Some of those people, those old timers that might have been a little skeptical, uh, we're now seeing some of the fruits of, uh, of the labor and, and you didn't have to work as hard. Uh, kind of like you were talking about with the, you know, the validity and, and the labor involved in, in, in check calling. Uh, it also improved uh, some of our efficiencies and productivity of uh, booking and covering our load. And uh, we no longer had to send out email blasts of what available loads we had. Uh, we stopped doing that. Um, so really for us, the two things was uh, the culture of Prasad's team and, and their willingness to work with us in some of our challenges with our, uh, initially with our TMS and the uh, smart capacity tool and the, and the value that that drove. No, great points, especially about the, the culture piece. And I, I know that we've, you know, we, we've talked about it now here and talking logistics now for, for the past couple of years. We're hearing more and more uh, testimonials like yours in terms of, you know, the reasons people pick a, a technology company as, as their partner. And it's because of that partnership, you know, approach. It goes beyond the features and functions, but it's really looking for alignment and culture and, you know, the ability to really work hand in hand in, in achieving not only the near-term goals, but the, you know, long-term goals of the company as well. So I think, uh, you know, I'm always, uh, I'm glad to see that the industry is finally moving in that direction where, you know, uh, technology companies are being viewed as partners uh, because ultimately it's a win-win for both parties, right? So it becomes a, um, uh, you know, a much tighter, you know, beneficial relationship for both. And I think the, the part about smart capacity is great because I mean, that's something that there's a lot of buzz and, and uh, excitement around that type of technology today. And, and certainly I think, um, you know, the fact that it's bearing fruit, uh, you know, for, for companies such as yours is, is you know, great, um, you know, great to hear. Uh, so Prasad, going back to you, I mean, when it comes to, um, you know, obviously you've worked with a lot of different, you know, companies as, as you, de you know, deployed the solution and, and, you know, like Mike mentioned, every company is a little bit different in terms of their approach and what works and what doesn't work, or whatever. But when, when it comes to deploying, you know, real time, you know, freight visibility or even something like smart capacity, the other solutions that, that you have, I mean, what, what factors are the most important to ensure a successful deployment? So I think most of the times, you know, Mike, Mike said a couple of things that are very true. He said, you know, getting people to change in his company, it, you know, it, it has to come from top down and it needs to happen in waves, not just in one shot, one and done. Um, so for any vendor, so from a vendor's viewpoint, when we work with companies like Linux Express and with, with Mike's team, the way we look at this is we, we try to set expectations that you know this is not a one and done. This is not a this is not magic test that we're just sprinkling and everything just turns beautiful one day, right? It's a constant process, and no two customers are same. Like this is a, this is an important thing. Like Mike said, right? I mean the culture is important. Understanding because the way a broker moves freight, uh, one broker moves freight with from another broker, they're going to be different, and the attributes that they look at is going to be different. Um, just so, you know, even on the definition of what constitutes a successful track, we have multiple definitions that the, the brokers ask for. You know, not so much on the definition of it, but the attributes that they look for. One might look for an update every hour, one might look for an update every 15 minutes, one might look, it for, look for an update every four hours, just near the exception, right? All that constitutes. So for a vendor to be successful in this, the first thing they have to do is understand their customer very well and be part of the process. Not tell the broker that, or, or the customer that, you know, getting high compliance is your responsibility. It's never that, right? Um, work with what works with their carriers. Make the carriers part of the solution, right? And also look for, you know, when, when we got, you know, Linux Express on board, we didn't achieve that high level of visibility on day one that we got with them. So we started off and month over month, our goal was to see an improvement in that. Um, and lay it down as, hey, we, in phase one, we're starting with visibility. Our goal is to also open up that matching side, the digital freight matching side. So we did work with them because these timelines will not be all aligned. You've got to get the ball rolling and add more layers to it. Um, today we have Book It Now. It's a completely automated freight matching to put it over the top. 
and it would be another rollout and we're, you know, we're looking at ways to improve that uh, with customers. So you know, work with them and share with them. Um, a lot of technology part players have a fear that if I share my roadmap with my vendor, um, they might poke holes in it. That's exactly the reason why you want to share it because you want a customer to tell you that you're on the wrong track before you actually go and build. You know, the traditional approach of people take a year to build something or two years only to find out that nobody likes that. Those days are gone. I mean, you can't do that. Um, so you make them, make your customers a stakeholder in your roadmap is very important. So we, you know, we don't, every call that we, we do, we ask our customers, what you like about us? What you don't like about us? You know, where can we improve? They'll say, hey, you know, these are the areas in that product that we want to see it improve. Um, so these are important for, for, for all of it. Now, all of this is between the vendor and the, the broker. The key part is we have never, people ignore the carrier because they don't typically sit at the table and have these conversations. And more, moreover, they're also not the, the paying customers. <clears throat> we try, try to ignore them. They are key to this. So what are you doing? You know, customers like Mike asks us, ask us this question. What are you doing as a vendor to attract carriers? What kind of a value you're providing to these carriers? I think these are very important questions to discuss up front. If you're in the market, ask your vendor, what are they doing to please carriers? Um, what kind of an experience they're giving to them? And, you know, frankly, check with your carriers and ask them. I mean, we had customers like, you know, Mike said, they checked the top 20 and said, how many of them are already on top of uh, We had some carriers where, or, or brokers that called their carriers and said, um, which one do you prefer? Would you prefer Trucker Tool or their own app? And apparently, you know, they said a neutral app like us. So that feedback is important. Yeah, and I think that those are all great points. And, and you know, particularly, you know, bringing in the uh, the carrier as part of the conversation or as part of the, uh, because at the end of the day, they're a critical part of the solution, right? I mean, they're the ones who ultimately are going to be using, you know, the, the, the application in this case and, and uh, you know, providing that, that, that data and information. Um, and then the, the other piece, you know, ma you know, making the, the technology partner be part of, you know, the, 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 you know, be part of the solution in terms of, you know, driving compliance, uh, you know, and, and, and so forth. Well, great points, Prasad. Um, you know, we're running a little bit short on time here, so I'm just going to go right to, you know, my, la my last question here. And, and Mike, I'll, I'll ask you first, and then Prasad, you can, you know, add your perspective as well. Um, so, I mean, what is the biggest lesson learned from your journey, you know, Mike, that you would give to other companies that are just, you know, maybe getting started on this journey? You know, I think the biggest lesson learned really would be to be, be patient. You know, Prasad was talking about it earlier about rolling it out in waves. And I think you're all excited. You've got this new tool. Um, it's got a lot of bells and whistles. It's got a lot of exciting things that it can do. And, you know, we just have to be patient and take it a step at a time. Uh, it takes time to develop relationships. As you indicated earlier, Adrian, change sometimes can be difficult. Driving change can be difficult. And you just need to be patient and consistent uh, to move forward and, and uh, a step at a time and, and keep the, keep the uh, process moving forward. In addition, really, as, as I, I touched on earlier, and I know it sounds a little corny, but culture. And, you know, if you're aligned with the right, you know, you're going to have challenges in, in any relationship. And it's just a lot easier to work through those challenges if, you're, if you and your vendor are aligned and have a similar uh, outlook and a similar culture. Great, great, great advice. Prasad, any, any final thoughts? Uh, Mike said everything, you know, very good um, in terms of change being incremental. Um, but I, I would say this um, from a vendor point, look for vendors that have fast-paced culture. So we've got to try different things um, and constantly push the envelope. I mean, this you can't rest, right? That should be a collaboration. It's but you know, if when as a vendor. Uh, you know, you want to spearhead that conversation with your customer and make the customer part of it. That collaboration is the only way to solve a problem. And, you know, um, if you don't collaborate with your customers early enough, you're, you're, you're going to deviate from the path too far and getting back on track is always going to be difficult. So at every step, 
sometimes you will hear things that you may not like, but make them part of the conversation. And instead of looking at technologies as visibility or digital freight matching, and we, you know, these terms are really floating high up in the hair. The way we will look at this is it's a cost of covering a load. What is the variable cost of covering a load for a broker or a 3 pr or a carrier? What can we do to bring that cost to almost to zero, if not zero, right? It's a variable cost. You have other fixed costs, but if we could bring it down through whether better visibility or uh, complete automation of booking a load, right? The, the, the digital freight matching, we call it book it now. Um, but these terms will stay and go, but that overall arching goal is how do you reduce that cost of covering the load? Because that has so much resonance in supply chain that it goes to the carrier, it goes to the broker, it goes to the shipper, and everyone wins. And the last thing that I would, I would add to that is when you look at technology, don't look at technology to bypass the carrier or the driver. That is probably one of the biggest mistakes we do. We don't include carrier or driver in that technology. We try to go around them. And by doing that, you're actually alienating yourself from that carrier or the driver. They'll figure out that, that you're trying to do it without their knowledge or you're trying to avoid them. It's so much better to have the carrier as the center of the uh, conversation and be part of the solution, not part of the problem. So, you know, things like, when you're talking to a carrier, ask them what technologies will help them um, that they are already using and ask yourself, can I adapt to what my carriers are already using? Then you're showing actions in when you say I'm committed to my carriers, that's a good commitment. You're taking a step forward and say, let me adapt to a technology that you are using. If it, if it, if it makes sense in the first place. Right? By keeping the carrier part of the conversation, in the long haul, I know the freight, the capacity is a little uh, softer today, but it's going to pick up very soon. And that happens, these carriers remember that, that you made some certain things to, be, to make them part of your ecosystem. And that goes a long way. Uh, so that's pretty much it. Yeah, no, a, lot, a lot of great points you know, from both of you. And again, um, you know, like I always say at the end of all our episodes, you know, we, we can probably spend, you know, a whole day or more, you know, talking through this, this whole topic and everything that's happening in, in the industry, but you both pr provide some great insights and advice, uh, relative to this topic. So, uh, Mike, uh, Prasad, uh, again, thank you for making the time to be with us today. Hey, thanks. I appreciate the invite. Thanks. Thank you both for the time. So uh, I want to thank those of you that joined us. If you're watching this episode on demand, uh, either at the Trucker Tools website or on Talking Logistics, and you've got a question or a comment for Mike, uh, you can or Prasad, you can post it there, and I'm sure that they'll be more than happy to respond via that medium. Again, thank you for joining us, and look forward to seeing you in a future episode of Talking Logistics. Have a great day.